my brothers and sisters in Christ, on this Good Friday, we sit at the foot of the cross, and in some small way we take upon ourselves the excruciating pain and humiliation Jesus experiences for our sake. May we come to a deeper understanding of how dearly our salvation was won for us. May our lives be transformed, and may we be ready to answer the call of our Savior to come follow Him, to take up our cross and follow Him, and not be enticed by the blandishments of this world. May we see beyond the transient, this, this transient life to the life eternal He has won for us. And now we sing a hymn when I survey the wondrous cross. Hymn 153 verses 1, 2, and 3. 
Forgive them, O oh my Father, they know not what they do. The Savior spake in anguish as the sharp nails went through. No word of anger spake he to them that shed his blood, but prayer and the tenderest pity, large as the love of God. For me was that compassion, for me that tender care, I need his wide forgiveness, as much as any there. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My assignment today is to minister on the first word of Jesus on the cross, which is taken from Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And it is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My reflection. Fellow believers, firstly, our Lord Jesus, while experiencing excruciating pain on the cross, did not cry out for his Father to take away his intense suffering. But instead, our Lord Jesus unselfishly prayed that his father would forgive them. In Matthew 9, 6, our Lord Jesus, referring back to himself, said that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. So why did our Lord Jesus not forgive them himself? The answer is found in 2 Corinthians 5:21 which states that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, since on the cross Jesus became sin with all of the world's sins, he had no more authority there to forgive us of our sins. Thus, he had to ask his father to forgive them. Secondly, who are the them that need forgiving? I propose that the them was not only limited to the Jewish leaders and Pilate, both who oppressed our Lord's, who orchestrated our Lord's execution, the them are all those who do not acknowledge our Lord Jesus as God's suffering Messiah. Also, the them was not limited to Jesus' disciples who abandoned him as he suffered for us on the cross. But the them includes us believers who live contrary to Jesus' commandments to love. There are so many believers today who praise God with their mouths, but have unforgiveness in their hearts. But thanks be to God that Hebrews 7.25 states that our high priest, Lord Jesus, lives to intercede for us. And today his intercessions still include asking his father to forgive us. Thirdly, our Lord cried from the cross that they know not what they do. Confirming these words of Jesus on the cross, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8 said that if the rulers of this age understood the hidden wisdom of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What about us today? Can we be excused today because we do not know what we are doing? I believe that we have no excuse because we have the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the deep things of God, including the power of forgiveness. 
Throughout our Lord Jesus' ministry, he taught us the importance of forgiveness. Besides his teaching on the Lord's Prayer, the teaching in Matthew 5.45 is also very striking since Jesus instructs us to love our enemies and also pray for those who persecute us. Although this may be difficult for most, our Lord is not asking us to do something that he was not willing to do himself. He showed us this on the cross when he prayed, Father, forgive them. Finally, during his suffering on his cross, we see our Lord Jesus fulfilling all the conditions for the rewards of the blessings stated in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. We see especially this when he said, Blessed are the peacemaker, for they will be called children of God. Wow. What a Lord. What a peacemaker. What a savior. What an example. Let us pray. Father God, we acknowledge that there is no other God besides you. And that you are mighty, gracious, and merciful. Father, this Good Friday, as we with grateful hearts remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, we ask you for the grace to forgive others as our Lord Jesus did. Father God, we acknowledge that you are greater than this coronavirus and that you have already delivered us from this evil. We thank you for giving us wisdom to use WhatsApp as your servant for ministry. In the name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Hymn 153, verses 4 to 6. It was my pride and hardness that hung him on the tree. Those cruel nails, O oh Savior, were driven in by me. And often I have slighted thy gentle voice that chid. Forgive me too, Lord Jesus, I knew not what I did. O depth of sweet compassion, O love divine and true, Save thou the souls that slight thee, and know not what we do.
through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seems my And now to the second word. Today you will be with me in paradise. And our reading is taken from Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hung there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, Today, he will be with me in paradise. We're seen is the top Calvary's hill, and Jesus hangs nailed to the cross between two notorious bandits. One of them, mocking and unrepentant, calls on Jesus to show his power if he is indeed the Messiah he claims to be and free himself and them. The other thief remarkably defends Jesus, speaks up on Jesus' behalf, and rebukes his partner. He, on his course of death, recognizes Jesus as the suffering Messiah, Savior of the Scriptures, paying the price of his sins and the sins of the whole world. This thief repents of his sins and seeks forgiveness and a place in the kingdom over which the Messiah King will reign. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, he says to Jesus. Jesus unhesitatingly responds, Today you will be with me in paradise. You recall that Jesus had said at the height of his ministry that he came to bring division. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And that particular situation during his ministry, Jesus particularly referred to divisions in families, father and daughter, mother and son, and others who would have responded differently to this Jesus. Here too, in the last few hours of his earthly life and on the cross, we see literally and figuratively, in terms of response to Jesus, a division. Two bandits, former partners in crime, one on his left and one on his right, literally divided. One with remarkable insight, recognizing the Savior in the most unlikely circumstances, on the cross of Calvary and responding in faith and penitence, while the other, unseen, untouched, untouched, unrepentant. Division. I came to bring division, and we see it at the very end of his earthly ministry. Jesus' response to the repentant thief recalls to us the parable of the laborers in the vineyard in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. In this parable, Jesus put, taught that it is never too late by God's grace for anyone to enter the kingdom of heaven if he or she responds in faith to God's call. We note to the extraordinary circumstances under which the bandits encountered Jesus on a cross at Calvary. We in the church today need to have a heightened sense that Jesus is to be encountered, recognized, and engaged 
in the most unexpected places and indeed among the most unexpected people. In the gospel she is found among the sinners, the tax collectors, the women of ill repute, among the poor, the sick, the lowly. Those shunned and labelled by high society. His mantra was, those who are well have no need of a physician. I have come to call sinners to repentance, not the righteous. All this speaks to us about the great challenge we face to leave our comfortable pews for the riskier, more demanding work. We will find Jesus among the poor, the sick, the suffering, the despised, the desperate, the homeless, the dirty, the ill-mannered. He is to be found, let us not miss this, in the most mundane, the ordinary events and encounters of our lives. On the bus, in the person who sits next to us, at work in the person who comes into the office who seems lost, in the garbage collector who patiently gathers the scattered garbage in front of our gate and throws it into the garbage truck, in the trivial round and the common task as the hymn writer reminds us. Will we recognize Jesus in those situations when he comes to us? And how will we respond? Remember what he said. Inasmuch as you did it to the least of them, you did it also unto me. Let us end, my brothers and sisters, by thinking about this unrepentant thief. Is he condemned to eternal damnation? Do you condemn him? Do we condemn him? What about his upbringing, his life that made him so obdurate even as he faced his imminent earthly end? Only God can tell. Let us pray for ourselves, for penitent hearts, for the openness, the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that we recognize the Savior in the situations and encounters of our lives and respond in faith and love. May our eyes be ever open to recognize him in the circumstances of our lives, our hearts ever ready to receive him, our lips ever ready to confess him, who gave his life, that all who believe in him will have everlasting life. Amen. And now we'll sing our hymns, we'll recognize them as they begin to play, and we'll sing lustily. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on whom was laid. Here in the death of Christ I
your mother. John 19 verse 26. I came across a book called Listening at Golgotha, written by a former bishop of the Methodist Church, Peter Story. In his book, he writes a meditation on this particular word of Jesus that I very much like and would share with you. But first, let us look at the actual text. We are reading from the Gospel according to John. Chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Peter's story writes an exposition on this reading. Standing below Jesus' cross is the woman who gave him birth, who nursed him at her breast, who nurtured him in childhood and youth. Now the sword promised by Simeon when her baby was presented at the temple has come to pierce her heart. Just three decades after his birth, her flesh and blood and bone, her son, hangs in front of her. Mary had often struggled with who this son really was. We don't know when the first stirrings of divinity welled up in his humanness. But at a mere 12 years of age, he already had been lost to the family for three long days. To be found in the temple debating its learned men. Even then there was a depth in Jesus that she could not fully reach. John tells us that Mary and Jesus' brother were with him in his early ministry. Mary played a major part in the first of his great signs in Cana, Galilee, urging Jesus to come to the aid of an embarrassed young couple by rescuing their wedding party. But then came another day, and Jesus had to remind his mother and brothers that he now had a much wider family. We remember this scripture in Mark chapter 3 verses 31 to 35 that reads, Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside, asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at these who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. The True Kindred of Jesus This passage might come as a shock to those of us who put a high premium on close family life, but we shall see that these apparently harsh words are actually the hope of a new world. This would become evident later. But meanwhile, Mary had kept all these things in her heart. The things she understood and those she didn't. She had known from the beginning that this Jesus child was only loaned to her. 
Now he is dying. And amazingly, even in agony, the needs of others still touch Jesus more intensely than his own. We do not know Mary's family circumstances at this time, but we know enough about the vulnerability of older women in those days to be fearful for her. For example, Luke reminds us in chapter 7, Once outside a village of Nain, Jesus and his disciples had come upon a little funeral procession where a widowed mother was burying her only son. The custom of the day was not kind to women without any male support. In addition to the grief of loss, this woman would suffer cruel marginalization in her village. Deeply moved by her brokenness, Jesus had raised that young man from death and returned him to his mother. The procession of death had become a joyous celebration of life. Now from the cross, Jesus honors the fifth commandment. He must ensure his mother's safekeeping too. He looks at her and the disciple who stands with her and makes arrangements for her. There is your son. There is your mother. This is Jesus' last will and testament to his mother. He has owned nothing but the clothes on his back and the soldiers have diced for those. But he does bequeath her a new son. To John, the disciple, he gives a new mother. Who is your family? Here we see the beginning of something profoundly different for all followers of Jesus everywhere and in every age. This interchange on Good Friday is a marker for any revolution in our understanding of community. Jesus entrusts the life and welfare of another to one of his followers and he places upon that new relationship the value we for ourselves have reserved for our closest family unit. I would say Jesus was sending us a directly indirect message. Of course, a bit of an oxymoron. But I agree with Peter as he says, no longer will obligation of mutual care depend upon blood relationship, but all will be welcomed as the one family of Christ. No more will our first loyalty be to tribe or nation or clan. For Christians, whoever does the will of God will be our mothers or sisters or brothers or fathers. From now on, the followers of Jesus will receive one another as a gift to be welcomed, honored and cherished simply because Jesus has given them to us. That should be the only reason we need. The scripture continues. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. From his cross, Jesus created a community that was to become family to the widow, the orphan, the outcast, and the stranger. I think the points Bishop's story raises points directly to our current time and practices. We have spent the last millennia operating in contradiction to what Jesus established in this act. Our focus has been on our own family, overruling the close-knit village community that was established by our ancestors. Our selfishness and tunnel vision has badly ruined us as a worshiping community, therefore leaving us with individual entities rather than one family. Any person that walks through our church doors should be welcomed and treated as a beloved family member, including the homeless, hopeless, the broken, and even those that don't look like us or have the same social standing. I pray that in this time of isolation, we see this as an opportunity to reset, recalibrate our way of thinking, our responses to each other and our relationship with God. There must be introspection. 
a refocusing so that even now we come together as a real family so that when our physical doors are reopened, we grow. Let us pray. We're praying for the unity of our church. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions. Take away all hatred and prejudice and whatever else may hinder us from godly union and concord. That as there is but one body and spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, so may we be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. sing in 161 thrown upon the awful tree The fourth word, Eloi, Eloi, Lima, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Reading from Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 36. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi. Lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And some, someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Jesus screamed in the heavens, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This must have been difficult since, according to scientists, the way crucifixion victims were hung stretched out the rib cage and the lungs. This prevented the condemned from exhaling effectively. The struggle to breathe would only become more difficult as the weight of a person's body slowly dislocated their shoulders. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' plaintive cry is the familiar why me that we voice in the face of helpless suffering. It expresses our confusion when confronted with chaos, with circumstances beyond our control. Why me? There seems to be a chaotic randomness to the evils of this world. The only recurring certainty is that bad things will happen and that at some point they will happen to us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' question reveals the nature of our minds in the face of uncontrolled crises. Our minds are hardwired for reason, so we assume that everything happens for a reason. So naturally we look for causes, for effects, for patterns in the chaos, for a reason why it all happened. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' question is a very personal question. We don't want to just rationalize what happened. We want to know why it happened to me. This aspect of the question assumes judgment concerning our innocence or guilt. While we cry unfair, we secretly feel responsible and guilt for our own suffering. Jesus was not exempt from this. Although personally innocent, on the cross he bore all of humanity's guilt. And that's even worse than personal guilt. This sense of guilt makes our cry feel hollow. Somehow we suspect ourselves as the cause of our pain. We blame ourselves. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' question is laced with shame. Guilt brings shame. While guilt results from a fact of sin, shame is the feeling of exposure before your own conscience, a most holy God and before others. Jesus was stripped naked both physically and psychologically. He felt isolated, ostracized, rejected, and abandoned, both by his own people and by his God. And God, the only one who should understand and help, now seems far away and silent. Where is the God who showed up at his baptism and at his transfiguration and proudly thundered from the skies? This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Where are you, my father? Today of all days you remain silent. Jesus could hardly breathe now, but he screamed at the heavens with as much strength as he could muster. Eloi, Eloi, Lima, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a question that finally recognizes a self that has no control, but a God who does. Our Adamic self-determination has made a mess of things. Now we are reaping the consequences. All that we can do now in Christ is call upon God for help. Though there was no response, God was quite near. He was, as the scripture says, in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God had promised, Psalm 1610, that he would, he would not abandon Christ to the realm of the dead, 
that he would not let his holy one, his faithful goodly one, rot in the grave. But in times of pain, it's difficult to feel loved and protected. This tells me that Jesus understands our pain and that because of him, we too will not be abandoned. Even if we die, that is not the last of us. However, what Jesus did next is what we should all do in such times. In the midst of his suffering, Jesus remembered the most important thing that his life was in his heavenly father's good care. So he said, into your hands, father, I commit my spirit. And he voluntarily gave up the ghost. Let us pray. Our most loving heavenly father and God, we kneel before your awesome majesty and power. We surrender control of our lives to you. We give up on our feeble attempts to lead our own lives in our own way. This world is full of pain and misery. We try our best to survive, but we know that we are ultimately powerless on our own against such dark forces of evil, sickness, natural disasters, like the virus we are experiencing now, such like. We yield ourselves to your will, to your love, to your salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit now lives and reigns. Amen. Hark that cry that peals aloud Upward through the whelming cloud Thou the Father's only Son Thou their Lord anointed one Thou dost ask him can it be Why hast thou forsaken me? Lord should fear He 
that I thirst, yet he made the sea. The fifth word, I am thirsty, John 19, verses 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Just about six hours have gone since Jesus hung on the cross. One can only imagine the sun beating down on him, him taking slow breaths, stretched and aching arms, a parched mouth. Taking a breath and using much energy, he says, I am thirsty. This short sentence highlights two specific points for me. It is fulfillment of scripture, and it is a confirmation that Jesus was human. Jesus confirms scripture and prophecy when David lamented in Psalm 69, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Psalm 69 verse 21. When Isaiah prophesied, Jesus confirms, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53 verse 12. The gospel reading continues with a response to the thirsty Jesus, him being given sour wine. Fulfilling what was said long before Jesus' journey on earth. However, my focus is not on the fulfillment of prophecy, but on the evidence of Jesus' humanity. This simple statement solidifies Jesus' humanness, him taking upon himself human nature. Thirst, something humans are familiar with an element that Jesus experienced. Jesus was thirsty. This in itself says to me that he was just like me. A few simple words that lead me to a reality that it can be done. If Jesus could do it, so can I. He lived, walked, talked, and survived for 33 years in a cruel time. I can do it too. He was faithful to the work of God. I can do it too. He was diligent in prayer and worship. I can do it too. I am thirsty. A reminder for us that as a human, he died for us to save us from our sins. A selfless human. I can be one too. A humble servant. I can be one too. I can do it too. I can do it too. I can do it too. Jesus did it and so can I. Let us pray. Father, help us to see that you are God, understand and know the plight of this world better than we do. Help us by your grace to maneuver this world without fear, doing the things that you have willed so that we can be true children of yours. Help us to be more like Christ. Teach us to be faithful to you to the end, picking up pieces and pushing forward where we may have stumbled. 
guide us, support us, direct us, and remind us that you are always with us. Through your Son we pray, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a river that flows as clear as crystal. It comes from God's throne above. And like a river, it wells up inside me. Join with me now in singing hymn 158, O Perfect Life of Love. sixth word it is finished John chapter 19 verse 13 when Jesus had received the wine he said it is finished then he bowed his head and give up his spirit O God our Heavenly Father speak to us we pray for we your servants are listening. 
Although for some it was a time of mourning, for many more this was an occasion for celebration. The blasphemer, the insurrectionist, was being crucified. This Jesus of Nazareth, this so-called Son of God and King of the Jews. If it were today, it would be a time for high fives and fist bumps, for champagne and glass clinking, for cheering and applause, for confetti and drum rolls and fanfare trumpets. Also rejoicing was the devil and all his demons of darkness. The Son of God is crucified. He is finished. Ironically, Jesus too was rejoicing. Gathering all his remaining strength, he shouted a shout of triumph. It is finished! He was already in celebratory pose, his hands in the air, nailed to the cross. He did not celebrate along with the crowd by saying, I am finished. Rather, he celebrated alongside of them when he shouted, it is finished. This was a shout of accomplishment, of success, of conquest, a victory won, a job well done, a goal achieved, a well-deserved promotion. They nailed him to the cross and were rejoicing, but he was rejoicing because he nailed it perfectly. It is finished. Jesus rejoiced because he had completed the plan of salvation. The enemy of our souls had come in and destroyed the relationship between God and ourselves. We, his most precious creation. He had tricked us into doubt and rebellion against God, knowing that a most holy God cannot have fellowship with sin. Therefore, God was forced to condemn man to eternal death. In his deception, Satan not only stole our relationship with God, but also all of the abundant benefits of life that God had given us. Dominion of the earth and even of our very souls were now under his control. We were snared into a perpetual life of sin, which furthered our distance from God. The penalty for sin is death and no penance of ours no good works would meet that requirement. Even if we died for our own sin, we would die deservedly. So there would be no coming back from that. We were finished. Day after day, we were forced to fight a losing battle against evil. The giving and receiving of love was an impossible task. Day after day, we were forced to commit evil just to survive and to like doing it. Day after day, we look into the mirror and see nothing but guilt and shame and struggle to keep it hidden with makeup and expensive clothes and things and lofty titles. Day after day, we must struggle against fear and terror, secretly knowing that as much as we struggle, it all ends in death anyway. Satan had won the first round. We were finished. But God always had a plan. Even from the beginning of creation, the plan was for God's free grace and mercy to come to us through faith alone. This plan unfolded with every dispensation, Abraham, Israel, and now the church. This plan always involves Jesus' fighting for us, dying for us, and being resurrected, raising us up together with him. This death would nullify all of the enemy's rights to us and all of his accusations against us. Everything he stole from us would be rightly ours again. Since the penalty for sin was death, Christ would pay that penalty so we do not have to. After thousands of years of human struggle, the plan had now reached its ultimate fulfillment. Jesus Christ was crucified for us. It now is and still remains finished.
need not worry about God's law versus guilt and sin. They are all nailed to the cross. It is finished. We need not be anxious about life's dangers. In Christ, we are dead to the world and have abundant life. It is finished. We need not be fearful about death's finality and about hell. It is finished. We have eternal life now, a life that continues after death. This salvation, our salvation, comes by continuous faith in the work of Christ on the cross and in nothing else. To God be the glory. It is finished. Father in heaven, we are most grateful for your finished work of salvation on the cross. We understand that there is nothing that we could do to earn your favor. We believe in you and your completed work. May we be ever thankful and express our gratitude with an intended life of holiness and commitment to your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, the seventh and final word from the cross. Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And our reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 44 to 47. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud, a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he 
he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. Now we come to our reflection on the reading. Jesus is at the very end of his earthly ministry. He had come at the Father's behest, and now with his last breath, he commits himself back to the Father who sent him. The task was nothing short of procuring the salvation of humankind rescuing the human race from the death of sin and opening up for us the life eternal which is God's destiny for us. It required one who was without sin to take upon himself the sin of the world and to pay the price of death so that by his sacrifice of himself the world might be set free from the consequences of sin. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 put it like this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Jesus himself in his own words said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Paul reminds us in Ephesians that God's plan of salvation in Christ was conceived from the beginning of creation, for God couldn't fathom humankind's separation from him by the sin of Adam for all eternity. And Jesus himself said it in John 3, 16 and 17, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. Paul in Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus was in the form of God. He emptied himself and took on human form. He came into the world in human form, born of a woman. In his life and ministry on earth, Jesus trusted completely in the Father, and in all things he sought to do the will of the Father. In the temptations in the desert, riding to Jerusalem amid the chairs and exaltation and acclamation, taunted on the cross. Jesus held firm in all these situations and in others. As he said in John 4.34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. On the night of his betrayal, when he faced the enormity of the challenge of crucifixion, the awful pain and suffering of death on the cross. It was to the Father that he went with his doubts and tears for reassurance. And now, at the point of death, he had seen it through. It was all behind him now, and only humanly death and return to the Father was before him. He had already uttered those words, it is finished, in triumph, and right on the heels of those words, Jesus, with death now imminent, his thoughts returned with the, to the Father. He had come willingly from the Father, and now with mission accomplished, he commits his spirit back to the Father who sent him. And with his dying lips, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit and breathe his last. The fitting epitaph 
if he had an earthly grave, would be. Jesus was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. But death, even death on a cross, is not the end of the story. This Jesus, as Paul tells us, who had emptied himself, took on human form, humbled himself, and subjected himself to humiliation and death on a cross, he is now risen from the dead, ascended and exalted at the right hand of God in a position of lordship and kingship. God raised him from the dead and highly exalted him, so that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At God's right hand, he continues his work on our behalf, interceding for us. We acclaim him as our Lord and Savior and King. He has overcome the sting of death and opened up the way for all believers to follow in the way that he has gone before. It is the way of humility, trust and obedience through which we too will be exalted in the end to be with him forever and ever. Amen. Now we will have our hymns Trust and Obey. We will sing. We will sing also take up the, thy cross, the Saviour said, and end with an Easter hymn, for Jesus lives, the very hymn, Jesus lives.
to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, even as you once entrusted your spirit into the hands of the Father, so I give my life to you. I trust you and you alone to be my Savior. I submit to your sovereignty over my life and seek to live for your glory alone. Here I am, Lord, available to you both now and in the future. How good it is to know, dear Lord, that the cross was not the end for you. As you entrusted your spirit into the Father's hands, you did so in anticipation of what was to come. So we reflect upon your death, not in despair, but in hope. With Good Friday behind us, Easter Sunday is on the horizon. Amen. <laughs>